Good evening. Good evening. What a great gathering. Um, I'm Tom DeLay. I'm Chief Executive of the Carbon Trust. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome everybody here uh, this evening for this year's uh, annual Carbon Trust Lecture. Um, I'm going to just talk very briefly uh, about what we're doing and some of our thinking. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, I just want to point out uh, that there will be no fire alarm this evening. Uh, if there is one, it's because we actually have an incident, in which case please follow the exit signs either side of the stage here or indeed at the back, and the meeting point is out of the building over on the left towards the park. Uh, that hopefully will never happen. Uh, so let me just outline things very briefly. I mean, the Carbon Trust is familiar to many of you, so uh, forgive me for maybe going over uh, familiar ground. We very much believe that economic prosperity and environmental sustainability can go hand in hand. We know that until now, natural resources, uh, including energy, materials, water, land use, have been abundant and cheap. And as a result, uh, the economy that we all enjoy today uh, is fundamentally wasteful, uh, whether it's transport, buildings, food, clothing. From a resource point of view, uh, it is wasteful. We know that the uh, volatility uh, aligned with the scarcity of some of those resources in cost terms, but also the environmental impact of the use of some of those resources, and indeed the growth of emerging economies, uh, means that the infrastructure, products and services of the future will need to be radically different uh, to those that we have today. Um, our partners and clients are the leaders in this transition to a sustainable low carbon future. Uh, governments, businesses, multinational organizations and the public sector uh, all fall into that and we work very closely with them, acting as a catalyst to try and help them achieve their aims. Uh, we listen very hard to their concerns and we develop bespoke solutions. Uh, we draw upon 15 years of experience uh, where we've seen and tried many, many things and I think perhaps more importantly than other successes, we actually understand why things often don't work. Um, so that's the kind of organization that we are. Uh, when people say, well, what do you do? I think a number of things. Firstly, we cut through uncertainty. There is an enormous amount of uncertainty. We hopefully provide insights that enable people to make braver, bolder, more positive decisions about the future, because they do get a sense that there's some clarity of the path that they're on. Uh, but we also design and manage complex projects and collaborations, uh, helping to overcome both financial and behavioral barriers and actually deliver real results. And when the time comes to celebrate success, we like to recognize achievement of our partners um, by providing assurance or certification of the outcomes that they've achieved. So all that sounds, uh, sounds fine, and it's an enormous task. Uh, and we're a very small organization. Uh, there are about 180 of us. We do have now a very small office in, uh, in China. We do have an office in Mexico City. I'm delighted that one or two of my colleagues are here. Um, we have an office in South Africa and a presence in both Brazil uh, and Washington, D.C. But fundamentally, the heart of the Carbon Trust remains at the moment for London, um, where you know, we do our best to act as this catalyst in so many different parts of the world. It's exciting. Uh, this year has been particularly exciting and also particularly, I think, challenging for many of us. A year ago, uh, the Paris Agreement, COP21, uh, gave a real shot in the arm to the sector. A momentum that had been lost since Copenhagen was found again. I think business confidence was found again. Uh, and there was a sense that, yes, there's a movement here that's getting going. And then, of course, we've had two unexpected uh, outcomes in terms of Brexit uh, and the US election. Uh, and everybody is saying, well, what does that actually mean? Uh, what's that going to mean to uh, the direction of travel, to business confidence, to indeed government's uh, will and the like? Um, I have no quick answers. I think it's going to take us some time to really evaluate. But I was very taken uh, by the comments of John Kerry in Marrakesh last week. And I will just quote one line because I think it epitomizes my personal view. Uh, it may not be that of my colleagues across the Carbon Trust. He said... Today, our emissions are being driven down because market-based forces are taking hold all over the world. Um, I think we absolutely uh, believe that the fundamentals increasingly point to the opportunity rather than the cost of this transition to a sustainable low-carbon future. Uh, our job as the Carbon Trust 
is to help make the case for change to businesses, to governments, and to civil society. That's, I think, enough about the Carbon Trust. Uh, people here uh, are looking forward, I think, to what I know will be a very broad-ranging discussion. Um, and it really falls to me to introduce uh, Nick Lord Stern uh, very briefly. If I were to really list all his achievements in this space in particular, uh, it would take me 10 minutes. And frankly, everybody being here suggests that you all know uh, as much as you need to know. Um, he is president of the British Academy. He is professor at the LSE uh, of economics and government. Um, I think his achievements are very, very broad. Let me, without further ado, introduce uh, Nick Stern, uh, after which uh, we will have a chance to take questions. So I would ask you, one, to formulate any questions that you may have now. Uh, we will have some time, hopefully, at the end to pull together questions and get some, some comments and some thoughts. And two, if you're interested, please do follow and communicate with us on Twitter. The feed is listed down below. Thank you very much for your time. And Nick, over to you. Thank you, Tom. Thanks very much, and thank you, James, for James Smith, for inviting me and for being a collaborator over the years. Um, and thank you, the Carbon Trust, for its leadership and uh, accelerate the move to a sustainable, low-carbon economy. Um, and it's an enormously attractive path to follow, and that will be in large measure what I have to say. Um, I will talk about innovation in a very broad sense. I will talk about it as fast, radical change uh, in the way we do things. Partly that's technological, but it's much more than that. It's uh, about how we organize our cities, how we put policies uh, together, and, uh, how, and so on. So I'll say quite a lot about the nature of change and the public policy that can generate that change. Um, and I will refer to, at some points, of what we've learned in the last 10 years. You must forgive me for that, because it's more or less exactly 10 years since the Stern Review was published, and so you reflect a little bit, what have we learned in the process? How would I do it now if we were to do it a bit differently? I won't obsess about that, but occasionally, when you hear uh, the last 10 years, that's sort of derived in sense from, uh, from that event. So I'll talk... Um, about understanding the scale of the problem and the pace of change and the immense urgency. Um, I, I'm convinced that we have not yet done well enough in getting people to understand the urgency. We haven't done badly in getting people to understand the problem, but not, I think, yet the urgency of our response. And of course, innovation is at the heart of that. I'll talk about policies. And uh, how many of you, of you here are economists? Maybe half a dozen. Uh, <laughs> you all had the opportunity. Um, well, maybe not all of you. Some of you had the uh, opportunity. Um, but what I'll do is talk about policy as if time matters. And often we talk about policy, we say, well, look, if we had this policy, um, it would deliver this kind of outcome. With current policies, we've got this kind of outcome. And I prefer the former to the latter, so we'll change our policies over. Unfortunately, that's a way a lot of economics organizes its discussion. I think it's not only economics, actually, that organizes its discussion that way. But here, pace really matters. This is policy as if time mattered, because uh, it does. And uh, I'll look at that. So the second part will be about uh, policies. Third part about infrastructure. Sustainable infrastructure is absolutely at the core of all this, and it's where a lot of my thinking and worrying is at the moment. And finally, I'll ask where the world is going, including post-November the uh, 8th. Now, but I want to start this story with the global agenda, because we have, for the first time since the years after the Second World War, a global agenda. Uh, these slides will be available. It's a wonderfully big screen, but nevertheless, I've abused even a very big screen. Um, I'll abuse it much more than that as time goes by. But what um, I've tried to do is to have a slideshow which is sort of like a paper. 
and the slides will be available. They're, they're public goods. Ask the, the Carbon Trust. I've even got references at the end, so uh, you can take it away. And, and I think it's, I suppose it's being, it's being filmed. But uh, I wanted to tell a story and leave a, rec leave a record of the, of the story. But essentially, we have a global agenda for the first time since the years after the Second World War. If you think the years after the Second World War, we had the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we had the United Nations, we had Bretton Woods and the creation of the World Bank and the IMF and what became the World Trade Organization. We had the beginnings of the uh, European community and so on. We had a global agenda. For the first time since then, 2015, we have a global agenda. And we had the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals in um, September of last year, and we had the Paris Agreement in, uh, uh, of course, in Paris in December, 8:30 p.m. December the 12th of uh, last year, and it came into force with remarkable rapidity. I mean, by early October, it had been ratified by the sufficient as a double hurdle uh, of number of countries, scale of emissions. It had passed that hurdle. By early October, it came into force on November the 4th, four days before November the 8th. And um, it was, that pace was remarkable. Kyoto took eight, nearly eight years. If you, and the Paris Agreement was 195 countries with no one dominant country, mercifully, looking ahead at a problem, anticipating. Straws in the wind, but largely anticipating the problem. Bretton Woods, 44 countries, one dominant country, the United States, looking backwards, 30 years of two world wars and the Great Depression, and blood everywhere. You had to believe in Bretton Woods in the days after the second, years after the Second World War, that collaboration made much more sense than what we had been doing. If you think of that, Paris is all the more remarkable. 195 countries, no one dominant, and anticipating the problem. It was remarkable and uh, cheerful. And the Sustainable Development Goals uh, three or four months before in September. So I think what we've seen is you have a global agenda in the sense agreed by everybody and applies to everybody. And we see in that global agenda the climate story and the development story very tightly integrated. And increasingly I talk about sustainability. Uh, I'm fine with green and I'm fine with climate. Obviously climate is a fundamental part, fundamental part of this story. But I think we now see it as this is the growth story. This is the sustainable, inclusive growth story of uh, this century. So that's, that perception is uh, running right through what I have to say. If we fail to manage climate change, we reverse development, the very hostile environment we recreate. If we try to manage climate change by appearing to put obstacles in the face of reducing poverty and advancing growth and development over this next couple of decades, we simply will not have the coalition that we need. And we got Paris because there was an understanding not only that the risks were uh, fundamental, deep, existential in many ways, but also that the alternative way of doing things was very attractive. It was the growth story, it was the development story, it was and is the story of how we reduce poverty in a sustainable way. That was fundamental to Paris. It was fundamental to Marrakesh, where country after country said, we're just getting on with it. We have noticed the result of the US election, but we're just getting on with it. And uh, that spirit was very strong. And it was strong for a reason. It was strong for the reason that people had understood not only the risks, but also this was a much more attractive way of doing things. And who knows? We have to see what um, the president-elect will do when he becomes president. He's declared for infrastructure as a driver of growth. I completely agree, and many of us have been putting that case for quite some time. And we suppose that he means um, modern, clean, and smart, as opposed to outdated, dirty, and not so smart. So why would you choose the latter? So let's see. He, in the interview to the New York, New York Times uh, a couple of days ago, and Tom Friedman, asked him directly about climate change. He said he had an open mind. And he, in a subsequent follow-up question, <coughs> recognized the uh, link between human activity and global warming. Let's see. I don't know, and you don't know, and probably he doesn't know, <laughs> uh, 
what will happen. But let's keep an open mind, let's encourage, and uh, we'll see what happens. But in any case, the spirit of Marrakesh is that we carry on. And it was remarkable and strong. Not just countries, cities, states, California was there, firms, 350 firms made a very powerful statement. Uh, in the spirit of your quote from John Kerry. So we will see that. I'm not, I don't think I'll say any more about that, but it was, it was raised, it's important, it's topical, and we're just back from Marrakesh. So um, that's the story. It clearly involves, uh, and I'm not going to run through everything here, but it clearly involves uh, very big change. It involves change in uh, sources of energy, the efficiency of energy, the technologies. It's not just innovation. It's very importantly how, in, 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 the technolo in the technological sense, but it's also innovation in the way we run our uh, cities and our forests and our business models and so on. It's right across the board. So in this... Uh, in, in, in the talk this evening, I'm going to think of innovation in that very broad, sense, deep sense of innovation, not just uh, technological. And uh, we essentially need uh, sustainability everywhere. Governments will frame the policy directions locally, nationally, internationally, uh, but we know that private sector will essentially be the big investor and drive the, uh, drive the change. So this is the story. Now let me pretty quickly, I'm assuming you know most of what uh, I'll say under understanding the issues. The reason I'm underlining it is in large measure because I really worry that the urgency and scale is not sufficiently understood and I'll develop that. So uh, looking back 10 years, it, I think when I said in the Stern Review the costs of inaction are much bigger than the costs of action, that I understated the story. I think looking back, the risks are much bigger than, I, I, I think we said they were very big. Indeed, we did say they were very big 10 years ago, but I think they're even bigger than we thought. Uh, we were emitting 10 years ago about 40 billion tonnes CO2 equivalent as a world. It's now more like 50. And that rise itself, of course, in the flows, goes with a very strong rise in the stocks of concentrations of greenhouse gases. Many of the things are coming through faster than we thought uh, at that uh, time. It, it, we were talking about 0 0.8 degrees centigrade or so uh, above average global surface temperature above second half of the 19th century. We were talking 0 0.8 degrees. We're talking one or more now in just uh, 10 years. Um, we, we know that the Arctic uh, ice is melting faster than we thought. A lot of things have come through faster than we thought. So I think the difficulties, the risks are bigger. But we've also seen enormous technical progress. Um, the, the cost of solar has come down by a factor of 10 or 20. The uh, cost of a solar panel in, come down by a factor of 10 or 20 in that time. It's been uh, quite remarkable. And I don't have to research, rehearse all the other kinds of technical change that we've seen. I mean, who, who would have thought 10 years ago that most of the car makers would be making plug-in hybrids or electric uh, cars? That is quite remarkable. So the change has been enormous, but basically it's been slower, much slower than we needed. But we mustn't dismiss the change because we should recognize the change. And the challenge then becomes the challenge of acceleration. Not of starting, we've started. But the challenge becomes one of um, acceleration. If you run this forward, we're adding two and a half parts per million a year, that number is rising. You run that for 100 years or more, and you get to uh, concentrations, which give us four or five degrees centigrade, which we haven't seen for tens of millions of years. Homo sapiens has been around for a quarter of a million, 250,000. Basically, our societies, with the growing of cereals and, and sitting down in villages whilst your cereals grow and so on, is, um, is uh, really since the last ice age, 10,000 years ago. And we're thinking of temperatures in 100 years or so, if we don't get after this, that we haven't seen for tens of millions of years, even three degrees centigrade, not for three million years. So the scale of the risk is uh, immense. You know that, but it's no harm in reminding ourselves. The, the scale of the response, people are just beginning to understand. You tell people there's a long-run problem, and there is a long-run problem, and they think they can take their time with dealing with it. Well, they can't, because uh, uh, this is a flow stock process, and... Um, 
we have a grave danger of locking in high carbon infrastructure. That will be a theme that I'll come back to, just how urgent the action is. But also in Paris, we understood explicitly, I think, for the first time in these international negotiations, the importance of net zero. Now, it's a, because it's a flow stop problem, it's really very simple. I mean, temperatures go on rising whilst the um, concentrations are rising. If you want to stop the concentrations rising, it's net zero, or balancing of sources and sinks is the Paris uh, language. Even if, God forbid, you stabilised at four degrees centigrade, you'd still have to have net zero. If the temperature's stable, the concentrations are stable, and essentially that's net zero. So the question then of the temperature that we look for is when we go to net zero. We need to go to net zero, we don't know exactly, say 2070, 2075, 2080, if we're thinking about two degrees. Well below two degrees, a bit earlier. 1.5 degrees, very soon. Um, so I think the net zero balancing of sources and sinks came in much more strongly in international discussion and it's a good way of expressing the scale of what we have to do. Um, knocking it down a bit is good, but it's nowhere near enough. We have to go for net zero and we have to ask ourselves how we can do that. So this is, I've already emphasized the importance of the um, uh, ratchet effect, flows to stocks, so the later you leave it, the higher the stocks, that's the ratchet effects. I've emphasized the lock-in, that's of fundamental importance. But let's just think about the next 20 years. We will, 3%, you all know that 3% growth rate more or less doubles in, you just take 69 and divide by the uh, growth rate to find out how soon it doubles. It's essentially the logarithm to base E of 2 that dri drives that calculation. So the growth rate of 3% or so doubles the world economy in about two, if it was exactly 3%, it would double in 23 years. But I mean, and you, that's likely the growth rate if you think of India and China growing along at 5, 6, 7% during that time. This is uh, a new world economy will be added in 20 years. What will that new world economy look like? If it looks like the existing one, congested, dirty, emissions strong, it's quite clear that the chance of two degrees would be gone. The infrastructure will more than double. Factor in 20 years, probably factor 1.3, 1.4. Decimal point doesn't matter to this argument. Uh, why will it more than double? Because many of the countries are urbanizing very quickly and they're going through. Um, uh, income levels where the demand for energy, transport, water and so on rises very rapidly. If we get that infrastructure wrong in the next 20 years, then you can say goodbye to two degrees and you'll have cities where you can't move and you can't breathe, you can't be productive and ecosystems are very fragile. That's the essence of the urgency. And we have to move very quickly. And I do worry that that is not uh, sufficiently well understood. This is a graph. This is looking at CO CO2 rather than CO2e, taken from the Energy Transitions Committee, um, Commission, I should say, which is chaired by Adair Turner and Ajay Matur, who is the head of Terry in uh, India. And the Secretariat is led by the splendid Jeremy Oppenheim. And again, that's another view. This is CO2 rather than CO2e, of the kinds of paths that we have to follow. The pace of change to do this is very fast. It's innovation, it's radical, it's urgent. And that, I worry, is not something that uh, we sufficiently well understood. So the Paris Agreement, I've already uh, really introduced it, but the one point I want to make here is that the Paris uh, set the target well below two degrees, pursue efforts for 1.5, but it also asked people to put in where they thought they'd be in 2030 in terms of emissions. You add all that up and you get to 55 or more CO2 equivalent billion tonnes from the 50 where we are now. Now the two degree path, let alone well below two degree, the two degree path looks more like 40 in 2030. You can do a bit more later or uh, a bit less later, but if you do a bit more later, you, and corresponding to less now, it's that 
going to be a tough ask. And so the corridors of what could achieve two degrees are pretty clear. Um, so essentially, in Paris, we said we were going to increase, even with good efforts, we were going to increase by 10% from the 50 we are now in the next 15 years. We actually have to decrease by 20%, down to 40 Paris was honest. Part of the Paris Agreement was we meet every five years to ramp up ambition. But my goodness, we have to ramp up ambition pretty, uh, pretty strongly. Paris was honest uh, and clear, but there, that very big discrepancy where people are currently intending to go and what's necessary to uh, meet the articulated uh, target. <laughs> there were other things around Paris which were very good in a mission innovation, International Solar Energy Alliance, Breakthrough Energy Coalition, and so on. But that basic discrepancy with where people plan to be and where we need is uh, extremely important. So, as they say, I spent um, more than 40 years working in India, and all my Indian friends say, if you give them a problem, they say what to do. And there are various versions of what to do. If there's what to do, you know, you give up. And uh, there's what to do, getting on with it. Well, this is what to do, getting on with it. And this is a, a diagram taken essentially through various uh, iterations from the work of Chris Freeman, the great historian uh, of um, technological change, in the pattern of Joseph Schumpeter, the great Austrian uh, Harvard uh, economic historian. And Chris, and this is through Carlotta Perez, a collaborator, close collaborator, uh, essentially he, and this is very diagrammatic, very diagrammatic but the idea is that if you look at the great waves of technological change, they come with innovation and growth and investment. This is the big wave of technical change we need that I've referred to. The radical change is a story of discovery, innovation, and uh, investment. Now, I, I do recommend Chris Freeman's work to you. All the references are the back end of this uh, slide, and they're uh, available. But essentially, you have to set up a system as if innovation matters. You have to build it into science, the technology, the politics, and uh, so on. There's some signs, just some signs in the autumn statement and discussions around the uh, industrial strategy that this kind of thing is appreciated. It doesn't come by wishing. It comes by setting up the structures that can make it uh, happen. Now, this is the nerdy economist in me. Uh, <coughs> You, you put in policy to overcome market failures. We all know, and we must know, about the market failure of emissions. You let people do something which is very damaging for nothing. If I take away your labor and you come and work for me, I expect to pay for that. But if I damage your prospects or your children's prospects by e emitting and I don't pay for that, then that's a market failure. And if we correct market failures, we can make everyone better off. And we can. So that's the... I called it the greatest market failure the world's ever seen. But there's more than that. We cannot say, just fix that market failure, everything else will be fine. That's the miss, a big part of the challenge. We have to invest in R&D. <coughs> Ideas are public. That's uh, a market failure. We have to act on that. We know the risk and capital markets are very deficient for reasons which won't always uh, go away. But there's lots of things we can do around that. I've particularly keen on de development banks. I'll come back to that. There's uh, networks. We all know that in networks, what I do influences what you can do. So you have to have um, government frameworks. That doesn't mean ownership. But you have to have government frameworks for them to work. Information is critical in this, both as consumers and producers. Now, this is very weak word, co-benefits, but uh, the extra things you get, uh, we must get away from it, but it's kind of locked in the co-benefits. But pollution in the UK kills about one in 2,000 a year. Sorry, yeah, because about 30,000, 40,000, population of 60 million. About one in 2,000 every year. Every year. Forgetting about the damage it does in other ways to people's health and lives and, and so on. 4,000 a day in China. India is far worse in its cities. It is enormous. And uh, that understanding of how big that problem is, is something of the last five or six years. And uh, because we've got much better data on where and how that uh, works, where the pollution is and how it, how it works. And that has changed the debate. But of course, it's not just the air pollution, it's what it does to the 
ecosystems. All these are ways in which the markets do not work, and you're going to need policies right across that to foster the kind of change. It's um, not just the policies themselves, it's the credibility, clarity, and consistency of those policies. Government-induced policy risk, and I made this a big part of my story when I was chief economist of the World Bank, government-induced policy risk is the biggest threat to investment worldwide. Whether it be purple or green or whatever colour, government-induced policy risk, which can take many forms, changing your policies every five minutes, not having court structures where anything can be settled, uh, threats of uh, takeovers, threats of harassment, all sorts of ways in which it can occur. But it, that is a hugely damaging uh, part of this story. We've seen some of it in our own country, some of it in other countries. The language I try to use is the language of, uh, I'm, not, I'm not patenting this, but it's the language of being predictably flexible. As you bring in and encourage change, and if you're successful in encouraging change, you don't need to encourage it so much anymore. But you want the rules, the way in which you're going to phase out or change your policies to be predictable. You want it to have criteria and be predictable. So predictably flexible is, uh, is key to this uh, whole story. Now, um, it's not just uh, the policies and the predictability. You have to go further into the institutions that can deliver the policies and the predictabilities. I will come back to the uh, multilateral development banks. But we um, also uh, have to think of things like information. And I think um, Mike Bloomberg's task force, which uh, should be publishing really very soon now, uh, which was set up by the... Uh, Financial Stability Board, chaired by Mark Carney, will actually be very important uh, in requiring financial institutions to disclose the uh, essentially the climate risk associated in with the investments that they have in their portfolio. That kind of information will be uh, the kind of institutional requirement that can really change the game here. So we have to think of policies, institutions, actions here in a uh, very broad sense. Uh, I've already mentioned the international collaboration. Those things were a big part of the discussion, big part of convincing people in, uh, in Paris, but um, they're probably moving a lot slower than they need to be. Now, I want to say something about sustainable infrastructure and cities, because uh, that's particularly where I'm working on policy at the moment. And essentially last year we had not only the story of um, sustainable development goals from September and climate in Paris, we also had the G20 agonizing on how to reignite growth in the world economy. We've had a very sluggish period since 2008. Things have recovered much less rapidly than many people hoped and actually financial crises have uh, much longer static, difficult periods than uh, other forms of uh, slowdown. So the reignition of growth is a very big part of the story and a very big part of getting policy buy-in. Air pollution and reigniting growth are for the here and now. Uh, you can think about climate change being out there even though the action <coughs> is for the here and now. But you get the benefits from reigniting growth, the benefits from air pollution, uh, reduced air pollution in the here and now. And sustainable infrastructure, finally we're getting through that this is the way to um, reignite growth. It was embodied in uh, um, Chancellor Exchequer's statement yesterday. It was the first thing that uh, the President-elect said in his acceptance speech. Um, after trying to be nice to uh, his uh, opponent. But the, um, that story, it's part of the IMF story now, and what we have to be very clear on, it's not just any old infrastructure. It's clean, sustainable, modern, smart infrastructure. And that, I think, is a very powerful part of the story. We've had historically very low interest rates. They will rise a bit, but my guess is not so fast so soon, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see. We've had the fastest, we've got the fastest technical progress the world has ever seen 
in terms of um, uh, digital, materials, biotech, robotics and artificial intelligence, and so on. It's absolutely the moment to go for the uh, modern and um, clean and smart infrastructure. At the time when we're seeing very rapid urbanization and that infrastructure is being laid down in the cities of the world. So infrastructure, absolutely the heart of all this uh, story. It is, um, just remember how fast the urbanization is going. We are roughly 50% in uh, towns and cities of 7 billion, that's 3.5 billion or so. The middle of the century, 70% of 9 plus billion, that's at least 6.5 billion. In 35, 40 years, will something like double the size of our towns and cities. It's a one-off historical event because population slows down, the rate of rise of the fraction urbanized slows down, and we have to get that right. And the shape of those cities that will, will double in population in the next 35, 40 years, their shape will be set in the next 20. It's yet another underlining of just how urgent the uh, action will be. We've looked at better growth, better climate. I haven't got time to go into any detail, but essentially the world's investment in infrastructure will rise from three and a bit trillion now to six and a bit trillion over the next 15 years or so. Depending how you do the sums, 80, 90 trillion over 15 or 20 years. It's that which is much bigger than the infrastructure stock that we have at the moment, and we have to get right. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not asking you to look at this, it's a diagram where we've organized the 17 sustainable development goals and shown, you can take it away and fiddle with it, but it's shown how sustainable infrastructure is at the heart of the whole story. It's the heart of inclusive growth, heart of environmental sustainability, heart of delivery of bas basic services, particularly to poor people. Sustainable infrastructure is not only the driver of climate change in decent cities, it is the uh, driver of the whole pattern of sustainable development goals. There is no horse race between climate and sustainability on the one hand and growth and uh, development on the other. To suggest that there is is just to misunderstand. The story of econo economic growth we're offering here is set in the context with the monetary approach to economic growth running out of steam, the fiscal approach to economic growth just starting to pick up, we have to see how far that goes. Structural uh, reform, always a mantra, fix the supply side, good thing, but often it takes a while. So sustainable infrastructure is the boost to growth. Uh, I didn't like the language of the third way, so I'm hesitating about calling it a fourth way. When it's a different kind of sense anyway of a way. But uh, you can see that this is absolutely fundamental. This is a diagram taken from the um, a Better Growth, Better Climate report that I mentioned, which I co-chaired with Felipe Calderon, the former uh, president of Mexico. And there we argue that actually you do need a bit more investment, but the big story is the nature of the investment in infrastructure. It's doing it differently. Again, I haven't got time to rehearse that, but I did want to uh, emphasize it. This isn't about savings. There's plenty of savings is insufficient investment, and the challenge is to get the policies in place that bring that investment forward, <clears throat> that change good ideas into real projects, and to get those projects of the right kind. Right kind of policies, right kind of finance, right kind of institutions in the way I've already uh, discussed. Now, I've already emphasized throughout, I won't dwell on this uh, any further here, but I've tried to set out in this slide with a few more numbers, the centrality of the urbanization and the cities to this uh, whole story. So let me go to my last part, which is about global collaboration and how well we are doing. I try to look on um, famous language of Eric Idle. I try to look on the bright side of life. I, I can really do the pessimistic story. I think I can do the pessimistic story as well as anybody. But I'm going to choose to look at the positive side. But at the end, I'll say what I've been saying right through, that the pace is much too slow. But it's important to identify the promising things because they're the things you want to amplify, pick up on. You've got to have something to accelerate. You don't accelerate unless it's moving in the right direction. And some things are moving in the 
right direction. This is the series of agreements that uh, we've had. I've already referred to them, or most of them, and uh, I should add the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, uh, which was very important, um, wonderfully led, uh, along with others, of course, by the, the splendid John Kerry uh, very recently. You've had the beginnings of agreements in aviation. You've had lots of stories of change here. There is an international uh, willingness now which surely was not there in Copenhagen in 2009. And a large part of it has come from the taking grip of this idea that this is a much wetter way of doing things. Lots of people have got carbon price stories. Um, <clears throat> the Chancellor yesterday uh, would have been nice if he'd increased the carbon price floor, but at least he kept it and uh, it's, uh, what, 18 pounds a tonne of CO2, which is a good deal above the European Union emissions trading scheme. So you've got uh, and got China going national uh, and, and, and a number of other countries as, uh, as well. So this is a story then of big change. I've just used the carbon price example. It should be much higher and it should be rising strongly. And I've agreed at the request of um, Carbon Price Leadership Coalition to chair with my close friend Joe Stiglitz a commission which will recommend on carbon prices and methods uh, of carbon price structures that could deliver on Paris um, and will report next spring, at, uh, next, uh, next April. Cities are moving very strongly. A big driver of Paris Agreement was the, uh, the um, group of cities that uh, uh, the prime, that the uh, mayor of Paris and Hidalgo put together. Uh, you're seeing cities moving very strongly. You're seeing firms moving very strongly as well. You've seen innovations in financial sector. Uh, more and more um, financial plans, legal in general, wherever you look, are looking to um, provide the opportunity for people in their long-term investments to go for the things which are not only the right things to do, but actually the most profitable and least risky in the, in the longer term, which is the sustainable ones. There's the, was the wonderful AP4 in Sweden, led by Mats Andersson, that was a very big pension fund that would uh, look at its whole portfolio. It would have some airlines, it would have some retail, it would have some cars, had all sorts of things, and it would look across its holdings and it would sell the one that was behaving worst. And it would say, why? If anybody asks me what do I think about divestment, I say, I think it's a good idea. But what I mean is what AP4 uh, was doing. Quite a lot of other things there. I've already mentioned the innovation associated with the Bloomberg Task Force. So the financial sector is moving very quickly. Now, um, the, the development banks, and this is a key part of what I want you to take away from this, the development banks are crucial to this story of sustainable infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is risky at the beginning. I mean, life is risky, but infrastructure is particularly risky at the beginning. You've got to get over those uh, initial phases. You need with you an investor that can give you political risk guarantees, can give you equity, can give you long-term loans, probably a package of all of those. Once you get through that initial phase, then you have a infrastructure project that yields moderately stable revenues, then the pension funds can come in, and they can come in on a big scale. So you can sell these things on and make a profit. And I was chief economist of the EBRD for uh, a little over six years, and chief economist of the World Bank for a little over three years. And when I was at the EBRD, people would, big firms would come to the EBRD, actually firms that could have bought the EBRD, I mean, John Brown and BP was one of them. I, I checked with John that I'm allowed to say this. So I am allowed to say this. But they wanted to be with the EBRD because risk went down. Government-induced policy risk goes down if you're in the company of the right people, particularly the multilateral development bank. So if you look at the instruments, if you look at the direct reduction of risk, if you look at the trusted convener, the multilateral development banks are critical in this. Some countries have good national development banks. They work, can work there too. Not so many, but some, some do. But this story is fundamental, I think, to mobilising the finance. Currently, the MDBs uh, lend 
40 billion or so a year in this area. That should be doubled in, at least doubled in five years, and at least doubled again in the next five years. If you go there, you're starting to talk from the uh, development banks, and you can add in the national, and that can scale up a bit. If you're lending a few hundred billion a year, and you have private sector multipliers of two, three, four, and you have the power of the example, then you're starting to get to numbers that can really change the character of these trillions of infrastructure investments. So I do think this is an absolute critical part of the uh, story, and it's where I've been spending a lot of my uh, time. Now, I've spoken about the AP4 and the uh, national, and their, uh, that's their, a big pension scheme in uh, Sweden. Um, I've also mentioned you know, the Unilevers and the uh, Walmarts and the Ikeas of the world, more and more firms are adopting, including some of the fossil fuel firms, adopting internal uh, carbon prices. So I've spoken about movement in the cities, I've spoken about movement at nations, and here we have quite a lot of movement in firms. Movement in technology is strong. Uh, we all know the story of the extraordinary reduction in the price of PV. This is a, that's, as it were, the power of the example at the very micro level. This is the power of the example at the more uh, macro level, and uh, we do know that you can grow and you reduce your emissions. And uh, the UK story since uh, 1990 is quite strong, 60% bigger economy, 40% close to less emissions. More and more examples of uh, very clear stories of um, reducing emissions in the context of, uh, of growth. China is absolutely remarkable. I've been working in India for more than 40 years and in China for nearly 30 years, in each case living for quite extended periods in those countries. The change in China is quite remarkable. And it comes from, that change comes from a very wide set of issues, deep worry about water and effect of climate change, deep worries about uh, air pollution, realization of how big they are. And, um, of course, they rather fancy themselves in winning green techno technological races, and good luck to them. So China's change is fundamental. It's based on very powerful reasons, and they have already become a leader, and other countries may come and go. China's going to keep going uh, very strongly. This is um, essentially coal in China, which peaked probably about two years ago. It might be flat for a little while, but it will start to turn down in two, three years' time. So it has already peaked, a bit of a plateau, likely to come down. I just illustration of different kinds of change in good direction. So it's not uh, all uh, gloomy. I've said a lot about the critical role of the development finance uh, institutions. This is my uh, last slide. Um, having given you a bit of a dose of the optimistic thing, things moving in the right direction, I'll come back to being anxious because um, there are real reasons to be anxious. Um, we have not yet, as a world, really come to grips with the criticality of the next 20 years. I explained to the World Bank, I explained to DFID, here's the numbers, double the world economy in 20 years, more than double the infrastructure, get it wrong, say goodbye to two degrees. We've got to change now. You can't change the next 20 years starting year 19. You have to start now. And they, the numbers are incontrovertible. They look at you and they say, yes, Nick. And then they go on with a conversation that they were having anyway. And that really worries me, the urgency and the scale we haven't yet uh, got through. But, but we have lots of things moving in good directions. The challenge is to get that understanding on urgency and scale, get the understanding of the immense opportunities, translate it into this real acceleration that we need. You can think of it, sort of the actions as an S curve, and we're sort of down the bottom. So we've got to really charge through that convex period. Yeah, a lot of you are engineers, right? You know about convex and concave and S curves. And you've really got to accelerate up that curve. That's the key. Innovation at its heart, whether it be technology, the way we run our cities, the way we create our policies. Let me stop there. Thank you very much.
there are actually references, so. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, thank you very much. That was really quite inspiring. We are going to take a few questions now. It just seems to me, as an engineer, that what you're trying to do is take 20 years of development and actually make it happen in the next 10. That's acceleration. Uh, the task is going to be enormous, but it's uh, one we'll do our best to live up to. Um, we've got a couple of roving mics. Please put your hand up. Okay. We've got a couple of people in the middle here, and we'll take some maybe groups of three. A late lady here. Shoot away. Yeah, uh, John Gibbons, UK CCS Research Centre. You spoke about negative emissions technology, and you spoke about negative emissions or net negative. Um, now, clearly, if we don't manage to go as fast as you'd like, then we may need to go negative, and that's imposing a cost on future generations. Do you think they'll be able to pay that cost? Thank you. And there's a lady here in the middle. Hi. I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, carbon capture and storage to reduce emissions from heavy industry. So making steel, cement, chemicals, etc. OK. And one more. Right in the middle, the pink shirt. Hi, Steve Farrant from Business and the Community. Um, I take two messages from what you've said. One is clearly about ur urgency. The other is also, at the beginning, you were talking about the great gain we've made in the global coalition for the first time since the Second World War. So my question is, where do you think we can draw comfort and inspiration from that an urgent global coalition is going to happen? Um, the, if we go slowly, then uh, to stay with two degrees, the next generation is going to have to go much more quickly. And if you force yourself to go more quickly, it can be more costly. Not always, but it certainly can be. And you'd probably have to scrap quite a lot of things uh, to, to do that. But one way or another, you pay the cost. I mean, if you don't do it, you pay a bigger cost, or your children pay a bigger cost. So can they afford it? Well, can they afford not to? I mean, it, the, the ethical question, is it right to inflict that, either the very rapid change or living with the costs of climate change on future generations? And the answer surely is absolutely not. And uh, in, in my book, Why Are We Waiting?, which you've all read, uh, published by MIT Press last year, <laughs> I have a whole chapter on the, I went back to the moral philosophy that fascinated me as a graduate student. And whichever way you look at it, you know, the, with a, you know, a Kantian mor moral Im imperative or social contracts in the Rousseau, John Rawls kind, you know, virtue ethics along the lines of Aristotle, or the sort of vulgar economics way of looking at it in terms of consequentialism, whichever ethical structure you put together, it is just deeply wrong to... Uh, to do that. Um, so one way or other they pay the cost. And it, so my answer is that's one way or other they pay the cost, but it's completely unethical to put them in that position. And anyway, we gain greatly from doing things the right way, even in our own lifetimes. And I'm older than most of you here. So uh, it's very important to insist that this isn't the sacrifice story. This is the story of doing things in radically different ways. And we get the benefits of faster growth, sustainable growth, cleaner air, and so on. So not turn it into us versus them. The CCS, uh, I, I don't see how we can do without it. Um, there may be that we find ways of doing cement and uh, steel that don't involve emissions, but we can't see that with any confidence at the moment. Um, now how we do uh, heating is going to be very important. And at the moment, you know, people jump straight to the power sector when they think about cutting emissions. And it does matter. Of course it matters. But in most countries, it's 20 25% or so of the energy and emissions. Uh, in India, it's a bit below 20%. Um, well, what about the other 75 or 80%? Now, some of that's the forests and so on, but a big part of it is, uh, is, is industry and heating and transport now. Transport, probably quite a lot of that will be electricity, so that 20, 25% of energy which comes via electricity probably will go up. I don't know what to, 40, 45%, and good. But there's still going to be the other half. And uh, I don't see at the moment that we can do without carbon capture and storage, so it does worry me of all the exciting developments that we see, 
that that one doesn't move anywhere near as fast as it should. And it's not an experimental technology anymore. Um, now, I'm sure, like tech, all technologies, with scale and learning by doing, you <coughs> cut the cost. So I, am, um, I, I worry that we don't pursue it fast enough. If you go to net zero, picking up again on the first question, we don't have many ways to take carbon out. Um, you know, there's uh, forests and there's uh, land in various forms in the soil, rehabilitating uh, degraded land, allowing degraded forests to grow, reforestation. There are those two methods. There's carbon capture and storage from bioenergy biomass. And they're at my wonderful dreamy friends who have these machines for pulling it out of the air, turning it into carbon fiber and replacing steel. And good, uh, more power to their elbow, but you wouldn't bet the planet on the fourth uh, <laughs> method. But we should actually encourage them to dream and come up with those things. You know, if you can really cut the cost of uh, carbon fiber, you could replace, you could replace steel. But you can see that as you run through the ways of going negative, uh, it's tough. You know, you need a lot of forests. You need a lot of uh, restructuring of degraded land. So I think we really do need CCS. The, the coalitions. Well, if you look at how they've been built, um, in Paris, you had very strong coalitions. You had the High Ambition Coalition, which the UK, and bless Amber Rudd and Pete Betts for this, they were very good. Uh, played a big part in that, and it was a coalition. You know, the United States was part of uh, that story. The small island states did a fantastic job of um, bringing people along. Really good international coalition politics. Um, going forward, well, I don't think... It wasn't just the G2, the US and China, but they were very important in making their joint announcement, uh, Barack Obama and uh, Xi Jinping, in November 2014 in Beijing, where they announced a year ahead of time what their targets would be for 2030. That was very important. Um, I don't think we'll get the same... I'm being careful with my language here, but I don't think we'll get the same kind of leadership um, um, from the United States, probably in the coming years. So you have to ask yourself what kind of coalition would form. China's taking its place in the world. It has already in climate. China will take its place, has taken its place in the world with the creation of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which transparency requires me to reveal that I am on the international advisory panel of the AIIB. China's become much more active in trade. China's taking its place, but it won't want to go alone. India, the Prime Minister, Modi has said that uh, this is India's century. He won't want to go, India won't want to go alone. And India and China won't want to go as a duopoly, I can tell you that. So um, we have to think, I think, we always have to think of the big ones. India, China, Europe will be very important. We hope the US won't get in the way. It may not, it may not. Let's watch the space, let's be welcoming, let's be encouraging. <coughs> But you need other parts of the coalition as well. You need four or five leadership groups. And they have to self-identify. You can't go say, well, I've been studying at the LSE and I've worked out that you're the right leader for this occasion. <laughs> um, people have to self-identify. But the small island states did a very good job. So there are, there are real possibilities here. But we do need that international coalition. The cities are going to be very powerful. The, the sub-national is going to be very powerful. But I think, particularly with some players in all this, it's the private sector of the firms that really have to speak up, speak up loudly, say, I can see what's coming here. I can see how it goes. We can see how it make it profitable. Customers will come to us if they see us as responsible and being sensible. And if we're responsible in one area, probably we're responsible in another area too. And, and the enormous technological things coming through. So I think we have to think of different varieties of coalition. Half a dozen or so states or groups of states to lead the charge, the cities and the private sector, and of course, civil society. The Pope has been fantastic on uh, My dad would never have thought he'd hear his son. It, sadly, he, he, he died 20 years ago, but he would never have thought his son would praise a Pope. But the Pope is... Uh, <laughs>
the, the Pope's been very good on this. The faith, faith groups are, are very important in all this. But we have to think of coalition in a broad sense. This is a big movement. It's not just a couple of leaders that are going to do this. Great. We've probably got time for one more round of questions. Right here. And then we'll go up towards the back. In terms of um, innovation, I'm most interested personally in, in digital innovation and peer-to-peer -peer networks and decentralized technologies. But in terms of physical um, infrastructure, Elon Musk recently said that um, if you get rid of all the subsidies for, for f the, uh, the oil and gas industry, then they have enough technology to, to, to power solar around the world. Is that true? Okay. Question. Hi, Cathy Baldwin, um, Environmental Social Science Academic, University of Oxford and World Resources Institute, Washington. I've lost you. Oh, hi. Can you oh, hear me? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm a social scientist at the University of Oxford and the World Resources Institute in Washington. I'm interested in the social dimension of climate change um, and what we can do to get that more onto um, national and city resilience and adaptation policy agendas, because we hear an awful lot about the economic costs of climate change, the science of climate change. What can we do and how can we address through policy what communities need to do and how communities need to be assisted to build greater social, behavioral, psychological capacity to be resilient and act positively in the face of climate change? Thank you. And one last question. Up here, the lady on, on the side. Thank you. Uh, Joyce De Silva, Compassion in World Farming. Um, you've been talking the big picture, and it's been fascinating, but there are hundreds of people in this room who, in global terms, are probably big spenders. And thinking about the area I work in, would you recommend that people's diets should, like growth, be clean, smart, and modern? And what would that kind of diet look like? in terms of animal products and the greenhouse gas emissions yeah. from livestock? Uh, I'll have to be all, all big fundamental <laughs> questions. Uh, I, I, I think Elon Musk is probably roughly right, and it would certainly be right if you had a sensible carbon price. I mean, we should get rid of the subsidies, a lot of them are implicit, strong carbon price, regulate or price out for the air pollution. If we did that, with current technologies, I think the, uh, the fossil fuels wouldn't stand a chance. They just wouldn't. They are not socially profitable. Because what I'm talking about is getting the prices right in relation to the externalities and the damages that arise. So I think Elon Musk is, is right. And uh, if we only got our prices in place, uh, the right prices in place, get our markets to work properly, in other words, fix the market failures, all this could happen very very fast. Um, the, I mean, think how big things have changed, even if we haven't got the prices very, you know, look back over the last 10 years. Uh, so, uh, I, yes, that's a long way of saying yes. Um, the social dimensions of uh, climate change. I, I think um, it part of the story of understanding, the understanding that brings the political will, that brings the change, is that uh, much of this is about how communities work together. Uh, you, you, know, you can't reuse and recycle other than in a community. You can't have public transport other than uh, in a community. You can't have combined heat and power other than in a community. So much of what we need to do is uh, doing things together. I think powerful examples uh, can help very much uh, in that story. As cities around Europe change to low carbon or zero carbon, they're going to show themselves as the most attractive places to be. You know, Barcelona's emissions, particularly around transport, are probably uh, a tenth or a twelfth of Atlanta. And uh, it has roughly the same population and roughly the same income per capita. And uh, where would you rather be, in Barcelona or anybody from Atlanta <laughs> here? <in Atlanta? laughs> um, so I think the power of the examples of communities and cities that actually function. I think education is very important. One of the great privileges of life is being, a being at a university, and however old you get, they all stay the same age. And um, if you ask them what matters to them, climate change is at the top of the list. So I think the young people are a very important part of driving uh, communities uh, forward. Uh, in terms of adaptation, it's, it's partly about looking after each other and uh, there are all kinds of things that you can do 
you can do that. Now, compassion in world farming, it is partly diets, but it's also partly the way we do things. I've been working in one village in Moradabad district of UP for more than 40 years, and we've got data for 60 years, 100% uh, inquiry for every decade since independence. And uh, I'm going to India on Sunday to work with my collaborators. Now, if you look at uh, systems of root intensification for cereals, rice is the most prominent example, Essentially, uh, you don't flood the paddy field, and you, um, that saves water, it saves energy, you get a greater resilience against uh, bad weather, and of course the flooded paddy field uh, um, uh, emits methane. So that's an example which is good for development, it's more resilient, adaptation, and it's good for um, mitigation. So there are examples outside the, um, the animals where this is uh, true. But a North American uh, meat diet is probably three or four tonnes of CO2 a year. The total available to us in 2050, on average in the world, for all sources, is not more than two tonnes. We have to be, as a world, not higher than 20 gigatons CO2 equivalent in 2050, for any chance of a two degree path. Well, if a meat diet by itself, forgetting about driving your car and eating your home, if the meat diet is three or four, then it clearly can't work. It, I mean, that's just arithmetic, right? It just doesn't add up. So what can you do? Um, well, you can eat different forms of meat, you can eat less meat, you can eat no meat. I mean, there are various ways of doing that. A wonderful guy I met in Marrakesh said that uh, he was changing the diets. I think he said oranges and garlic. That he. Uh... <laughs> One of the great things about these things is you meet people with wonderful ideas, and they sometimes pin you against the wall. But, uh... <laughs> but you know, it may be, there may be this. Maybe he said it only reduced it by thirty percent the methane. So I, I, I think that the way in which the amount of meat, the type of meat the way in which it's raised is very important. I mean, if, if, if meat is raised from soya, which comes from deforested land, that is very destructive. Other, other ways are different. So I think we have to be careful. I mean, you know much more about it than I do. But uh, we have to be careful about generalizing too much. But we can say there's some sums that just don't add up. Nick, thank you. Um, in wrapping up, I'm just going to say three things very quickly. Firstly, uh, please do join us upstairs where we started. Uh, come and have a drink with us. We'd love to hear from you uh, and get any thoughts that you may have. Secondly, thank you very much indeed for coming this evening. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's made this evening very interesting in all uh, kinds of ways. I think the questions are outstanding. I wish we could go on now for the next hour, but we, we can't. And lastly, please thank uh, Nick, our speaker, who has been just so inspirational this evening. Thank you very much, Nick, for all that you're doing. Thank you.